Daniel, uh, as a young man, as a boy, probably just in his teens, was exiled out of Israel, out of Jerusalem, and into this new foreign land about 50 miles south of Baghdad called Babylon. And he ruled under a variety of different kings, probably four or five different kings. Over and over again, Daniel never compromised in what he believed. Daniel never lost sight of the promises of God. And yet over and over again, Daniel would rise to prominence in the Babylonian culture some four or five different times. And he never played political ball to get there. I want you to understand this. Daniel never compromised in his beliefs in order to maintain a status or in order to guard himself or protect himself or self-preserve himself. Every time Daniel was faithful to God, trusted in his promise, did what God called him to do, and God would use him to make an impact on the culture. As a matter of fact, Daniel would have been known in this culture as an outlier. He didn't believe like the rest of them. He didn't operate with any of their religious practices. And he was a prophet of the Lord who never wavered on God's promises. Wouldn't that be a cool thing to be known for? That your faith never wavered? There's a handful of things that I'm known for uh, at 37 years old. I'm starting to get a reputation as being handy. Not great, but handy. I can fix things. I certainly don't mind buying tools to try. All right, it's a really fun thing to me. I like tinkering, all right? Whether it's uh, on a small motor, a lawnmower in my garage, messing with stuff, I like being known as that guy. Some of my heroes when I was a kid were people who were a, a jack of all trades. And I would genuinely think as a kid, I want to be like them someday. I want to know how to do all those things. My neighbors know that my landscaping matters to me. I left this morning, looked at the lawn, and thought, I wonder if I have time to cut the grass so it looks right for Sunday. I real life thought about that at 6.30 this morning because I didn't think it looked right. It's something I'm known for. I like when people walk by and they appreciate our landscaping. I know it's a nerdy thing. It's my thing, all right? You get your own thing, and you'll find something that you like being known for. I also get known as a girl dad. Now, I don't think it's rare to have four kids, but apparently when they're all girls, people stop you in public, and they want to talk to you about it. They're like... Hang in there. Like it's a survival show. Like I'm about to push the button and go home, leave the island or something. It's not like that, but it's something that you get known for. Uh, there's other things that I want to be known for. Uh, there's other things that I, I want to be known for one day, but the jury's still out. There's still time remaining on the clock before I could ever be known for these things. I want to be known as one of those guys, if they're still a newspaper in existence in another 40 years, I want to see my picture in the paper with my wife as one of those 60 or 65 years married pictures. I think that'd be cool. And so we make some choices on how we uh, appreciate and respect one another, um, and we constantly never settle for good. We're always in pursuit of great. So we got one of those marriages that, that really stands the test of time. Uh, there's other things I want to be known for someday. I want people to not even know if I'm cognitive enough to be in a worship service, and then I go up to preach. I'm so old. Like, I look forward to that. I want to be one of those guys that barely makes it up here. I preach on the ground because I'm too old to make it up the steps. Like, I hope I go out that way, just preaching right up to the end. I want to be known for it. But what do you want to be known for? There's lots of things that, that we would like to be known for. There's aspirations in your heart. If you were really honest and you make decisions that kind of help you achieve those goals. Now, maybe some of them are short-term. Maybe some of them are even short-sighted. Maybe if you said them out loud, they wouldn't really be that important after all, but maybe you have some big things that you feel like God has burdened your heart for, that you feel like God has created you for, and, and really you'd like to be known for it. There's, there's this remarkable intersection that happens in our life. When following Jesus, Jesus a, a crossover of sorts, when, when everything that my heart desires aligns with who God is, and so these aspirations, this call, this burden for purpose in me falls into an alignment with who God created me to be. And it's very intentional. It's why you hear whispering outside of, of the church world and outside of Christ followers that they look for purpose. It's because there's a longing inside of us to be designed and to matter. And if you've ever felt that mattering of sorts, then what you'll, what you'll find if you pursue the truth about who God is, is that there's an intersection where God gets the maximum glory, and I live in my purpose. And where that is, is joy. And I can live a life that matters. 
And we want to live a life that really matters. In Psalm 37, I don't have it on the slide, but I just, just earmark it in your brain. The psalmist wrote, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. What do you cultivate? Delight yourself in the Lord. Your joy in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. Because in this new creation, in this new heart of sense, I get a desire that, that lives into this fullness of what I've been created for, and it's exactly who God created me to be, so he gets all the credit, and he gets all the glory. It's something that we live for. It's something that we look for, but it doesn't always feel that way when you're in the fight day in and day out. Some of you are going home and looking at your marriages or looking at your parenting, and you're saying, I, I don't know how this is my purpose. It's hanging on by a thread. And it doesn't always feel like purpose-filled joy. Sometimes it can feel like going through the motions. Sometimes we do that with our work ethic. If you're in a job that doesn't feel like it's who you were created to be, and you wonder, how am I, uh, how am I supposed to, to work as though I'm working for the Lord in this? It, it's hard. And so it impacts our patience and our kindness and our gentleness. And, and we really wonder, what is it about us in following God that's different than the world around us? When it comes to the life of Daniel, we see a man that, that over the course of 80 years, through unthinkable hardship, through unthinkable pain, through unthinkable uh, obstacle that he would face over and over again, chose the path that was faithful to God. When we fix ourselves on who God is, when we tether our beliefs in a worldview to a truth that lives in the accuracy of Scripture, and when we're led by the Holy Spirit, we find ourselves at the end of our days with a life that mattered. And that's the kind of church we want to be. Daniel was 80 years old or more. And it's likely his fourth or fifth ruler that he had served under when we get to Daniel chapter 6. You can follow along on the screen. You can go in your paper Bible to Daniel chapter 6. Or you can go in your YouVersion Bible app and get there. And what we're going to do is we're going to work through one of the most common Bible stories that we've seen in Scripture it's one that you grew up here in, in Sunday school, if you grew up in Sunday school. It's a popular one. It's Daniel in the lion's den. Verse 1 starts with this. It pleased Darius the king to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom, with three administrators over them, one whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. The king, Darius, the ruler of that day, had set up an accounting that there'd be these 120 satraps, local governors throughout the community, three advisors over them, and this was an accountability system. This was to prevent corruption so that there wouldn't be some misleading that would happen. Now, verse 3, Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. There was something unique about Daniel. And I think what the scripture implies is that when it, was, uh, when it came to observing who had integrity, 120 governors and, and two advisors over those governors had some wink and handshake agreements, some back alley agreements that it was okay to look the other way on. And you had this stickler, this rule follower in Daniel. And the governors, these 120 satraps and, and two advisors, they didn't like how distinguished Daniel was in something about his quality. I, my assumption is an integrity-based quality. Verse 4, at this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. You know what this tells me? If they're looking for corruption, and they're looking for negligence, but they can't find it in him, it's likely in them. You ever feel like out of place in your world? Because you're the only one who wants to operate with integrity? Or you get so frustrated by how callous and self-centered the world can be? Daniel relates. Daniel was well into his 80s at this point. He didn't care much of what other people thought of him. My good friend Leslie Butcher taught me something probably over a year ago now. Leslie's a, a friend that comes and helps us here at the church from time to time. She was originally a friend of Rochelle's. Um, and Leslie, I was talking to her about this kind of relationship. 
this kind of tension that we feel sometimes, where uh, we do things well, but we, we don't necessarily operate in our, in our gifting. And she said, well, there's a difference between your spiritual gifts and fruit. Now, I, I want you to track with me here for a minute, but we're going to run through some Bible. And I want you to follow along. It's not going to be on the screen. 1 Corinthians 12, Paul teaches us that each and every one of us is followers of Christ. If you're a new creation in Christ, you've been given a gift set, and you're a valuable piece of the body. Charlie Ferguson says, everybody's somebody in Christ's body. It's his famous line. You have value to the kingdom, whatever God's designed you to do. You have a gifting in that. It's why when you watch worship, you see a, a very prominent gift set. If you've ever been led in worship by Sarah Wyndham, she's a, a very gifted singer. And so she's very gifted at leading us in worship. But in Galatians 5, Paul talks about something that we confuse with gifts sometimes. And he talks about fruit of the Spirit. Fruit only grows when you're close to God. A gift is a gift. You've been born with it. God gave that to you. But fruit comes when you spend time in proximity of God. You see the difference? You see, fruit, uh, Paul says in Galatians 5, are things like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and goodness and faithfulness and self-control. You've never come across somebody and thought to yourself, they're just too patient. It annoys me. I wish they weren't so kind. I wish they didn't have such good self-control. I don't like their self-control. I don't want to hire them. No, these are, Paul says these are things that there is no law against. You want as much of that in your life, but we confuse the two as being one and the same. And this is why we get misled with bad leadership sometimes. When you follow somebody's gifting, but the fruit in their life isn't produced by a closeness to God. You know what the strongest piece of Sarah Wyndham's ministry is? It's not her worship. It's her time spent with Jesus every day. You could take that to the bank. She's in God's word every day and in prayer every day. And worship, where that's a gifting, fruit is produced in her life by her time spent. You know what Daniel was? Daniel was a leader that distinguished himself regardless of what crowd he was in because he was gifted by God to do so. But the fruit that he produced in his life came from his daily time spent with God. And if you want to become really great at what God designed you to do, if you want to really live with purpose, if you really want to leave your mark and make an impact and move the needle for the kingdom and lead your family well, it starts in the day in, day out fruit of your time spent with Jesus. And it's what Daniel was so excellent at. And they could find nothing about him that didn't distinguish himself from the crowd. The scripture goes on in verse 5 and says this, finally these men said, we'll never find any basis for charges against this man Daniel unless it has something to do with the law of his God. We'll never have a basis for it. So the administrators and the satraps went as a group to the king and said, may King Darius live forever. The royal administrators, the, the prefects, the satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict. And enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days except for you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. You see, they devise this plan that they'll just kind of pamper Darius' pride. Hey, Darius, what if for the next 30 days we just make it about you? And Darius goes, doesn't sound bad to me. I kind of like attention. And that sounds like a nice thing. And, and they prompt him a little bit. They're like, well, you should really double down on it and make it a law that's irrevocable. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so it can't be altered. Put it in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which, which can't be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Just think about it like at the state level up to the federal level. Make it like to a federal standpoint that nobody can rebuke this. For the next 30 days, Darius, it's all about you. And Darius is going, That'd be, that would be pretty special. The Persians, the Medes, they would know that in this land, all of you are giving me the attention. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. And three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. Here's what I'm afraid some of you heard. You ever gotten one of those uh, forward this to 10 people 
or if you're a true follower of Jesus. If you don't, you're ashamed of your faith, one of those emails. Everyone's uncomfortable because you're afraid it's somebody in the room who emailed you that. Do you remember that forward? And yet there's this catch in your spirit that's like, if I don't forward this, I don't have faith. Here's what I think some people do. We run into the conflict to try to be part of the right side of it. Instead of it just being a fruit that was produced as a byproduct in us. Here's the real question I want you to ask yourself as as you engage with this. If prayer was made illegal today, how many of you would be found guilty? It makes me uncomfortable too. If it was outlawed, would we have to run out in public and say, no, 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 we do pray. We're going to start praying. We're going to start praying every day. Or is it already a, a peace in our life that's instituted to produce fruit? And so whatever the culture does around us, this doesn't waver. This is who I am. This is my time spent with my Savior, the God whom I admire, the God whom I love. He has the deepest part of my affections. So whatever the culture does that challenges that, I don't have to run to the fire. I'm already in it. I'm already engaged with it. And Daniel just went back to the thing that he does every day. It wasn't new. He wasn't drawing a line in the sand and saying, now I'm part of this team. I'm against you guys. It was already who he was. And at some point, you have to have a day one that says, this is who I am from this point forward. And I'm not going back. They were waiting for Daniel. They were watching him. Verse 11 said, then these men went as a group. Think about this. This is 122 political leaders that are keeping their eye on Daniel. They went as a group and they found Daniel praying and asking God for help. It was predictable. He was there three times a day. So they went to the king and they spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any God or human being except you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den? Wouldn't it, didn't we just talk about this king? Aren't the next 30 days all about you? And Darius is like, you're right. The decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who's one of those exiles from Judah, He pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. And when the king heard this, he was greatly distressed, and he was determined to rescue Daniel. And he made every effort until sundown to save him. Guys, there's a real cultural attempt in us to soften the feeling of responsibility and guilt when we're wrong. Hear that again. There is a real cultural attempt in us to soften the weight of responsibility and guilt when we find one another wrong. And so we race in compassion with with a decent heart, but we we remove the, the feeling of consequence when we find ourselves wrong. You know what Darius was burdened by? That in his own selfishness, in his own conceitedness, it was going to cost his best advisor and, dare I say, friend, his life. And there was no getting out of that feeling. It was real guilt. It was real, I was wrong. And it's sad because we live with this burden, this awareness that when we come in conflict with our own sinfulness, that we understand that there's a great cost to that sin. The cost cost epically was Jesus Christ on the cross. That he came and exchanged his life for ours. That the wage of sin was death, And God said, I'll pay it in full with my son, who was perfect, who was without sin, who was fully God and fully man, yet he made himself nothing, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And he traded that. But there's this secondary consequence of sin, and it's it's like a cancer that spreads. And there's a real weight that comes when you realize that my sin has had an impact on some of the most precious lives in my life around me. I want you to love God so much that you flee flee from your sin for him. But I don't think it's wrong to flee from your sin because you want to honor your wife. I don't think it's wrong to flee from your sin because you know it's going to honor your children and raise your children with an example of humility. I think you should flee from sin because you want to be that quality of leader in your workplace. I think you should flee from sin because uh, as a humble jar of clay, the good news of Jesus that you carry with you and in you gets portrayed 
in the victory of Christ, not in the concealment of what you keep hidden. And sometimes we tell people all the mess that we're in and all that he's redeemed us from because it's integrity. We can't be so quick to run from that weight of being wrong. So the king gave the order and they brought Daniel and they threw him into the lion's den. And the king said to Daniel, can you just imagine the tone of his voice? May your God whom you continually serve rescue you. Someone would benefit to understand the same truth that Darius would later learn, that our God continually saves, if not here in eternity. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. The signet ring, it, can you imagine marking it, like sealing somebody's fate? I don't mean to keep going back to this weightiness of our sin. But it's my sin who sealed my Savior's fate. And if I had a signet ring or if I had to initial next to a line, it'd be my initials. I wasn't there. I wasn't Pontius Pilate and I wasn't in the crowd chanting crucify him. But he went there because of me and because of you. There's a burden to this. And the king returned to his palace and he spent the night without eating any entertain or without any entertainment being brought to him and he could not sleep. The next morning at the first light of dawn imagine 122 uh, of the the leaders of their government are waking up like it's over. The king got up and hurried to the lion's den. And when he came near the den he called out in, a, in an anguished voice, "Daniel, Servant of the living God, has your God, whom you continually serve, been able to rescue you from the lions? Talk about a pregnant pause, right? Talk about the climax of the story. Everybody else thinks it's game over. They thought it was game over by sunset. Everybody else thinks this is done. Darius races, and now the, the, the seal can be broken. Daniel, are you still in there? Daniel, did your God rescue you? And, and, and the, the pause that they, they would have felt, the intensity of that moment, and Daniel answered, may the king live forever. Imagine the echoed voice that came out of that place. May the king live forever. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. They've not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I ever done anything wrong before you, your majesty. And yet here I sit, still sitting with the lions. I still hear him breathing. I still smell the, smell the pit of that room. And 120 satraps and two appointed officials and their families stood stunned. Disbelief. And the king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. Yesterday, we were over at my grandpa's. Uh, this isn't meant to play on your emotions. My grandpa at 91 passed away last April, lived a, a full life right up to the end. I mean, it was a tough last 18 months or two years, but man, the guy was working in his garage every day through 89 at least. And we were in that garage yesterday. We were combing through different things and different parts. And I got thinking this week of, of what I'll be known for. I, I, hope I, I hope I hit 91 someday. I wouldn't mind if it looked like my grandpa's. But I read what was remembered about him in his obituary. I pulled it up online, those things live forever, and, and it covered the basics. He was born on March 22nd, 1930. But where I really think it got good was he was a veteran of the U.S. Army. Dale married the love of his life, Norma Jean Marsden, on March 8th of 58. They were married 63 years. He was a lifelong farmer, and here's where it turned the corner, who loved the Lord and his family. It's the priority of who he was. He lived most of his life on the family farm where he started his side business, Dale Meyer Garage. He enjoyed working on tractors, lawnmowers. He was known for baking his famous oatmeal cookies. We still don't know what the recipe is. It's gone. That the whole family enjoyed. He was a special man who rarely complained, and with God's grace, he lived his faith and felt very blessed every day of his life. Some of his happiest moments were spent with his grandchildren. Anyone who got to meet him would say he was hardworking, 
kind man whom you never forgot, and they might add stubborn, but in the best way. Man, I hope I get remembered for stuff like that. But you don't get remembered for things like that. You don't get remembered for loving your God first and foremost and leading your family in that way unless you start right now. You don't get to start legacy in the 11th hour. It, you, you have this moment where if you're hearing this good news and, and you hear what God has done, it should come with some burden on you. It should fall heavy on you of, of what will I be known for? And am I living a life that matters? Because here's what I know. I, I was redeemed with a purpose and so were you. I was bought with a price that I could never repay back, but now I live a surrendered life in response to it. And so whatever direction God sends me in, I'm full steam ahead. No questions asked. I heard an old preacher this week say, if God tells me to run through a brick wall, I start running and hope that he creates a hole before I get there. I just do what he says because I love him that much. What are you doing to foster this kind of loving relationship with your father in heaven? What are you doing? For some of us, you, you got to take a first step. Today's your line in the sand. When, when belief starts to come alive in your heart, it, it's such an impossible thing to explain, but it should compel you to change. When, when you come into the uh, contact of the reality that Jesus went to a cross, died, and was resurrected, and because he has new life, you can have new life in him. When you're confronted with that, it begs you to change. And this is why we confess our sin, and he's faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is why we confess, not with shame of what our peers think, but because our Savior already paid for it. This is why we repent. I've lived my entire life, my 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years going this direction, but I'm not going that way anymore. I'm following Jesus. And people will ask, and they'll say, what are you doing? You're, you'll just tell them, I started a new legacy. I want to live a life that matters, and the only way I know how to get there is to follow Jesus. And so I repent. Maybe you need to take a stand for God. We celebrate this every week as a, as a public display of what God's done in our heart through baptism. I've been buried with Christ. That's the symbol of the water. And, and I've been resurrected to new life to show to the world around me what's gone on. I repeat that profession of faith out loud ahead of that. Maybe, maybe it's something else for you. You need to take a stand and you've been living a compromised life where you want to follow Jesus, uh, yet you keep one foot in this old sinful lifestyle. There's this spot in Galatians chapter 1, verse 10 that says, am I living for the approval of God or man? If I'm living for the approval of man, I'm no longer a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who do you serve? Who do you take a stand for? What you take a stand for will call you into your purpose and it will lead you into fruit-producing habits. You'll start to see the spirit win out in your flesh where you produce more love, more peace, more patience, more kindness, all those things you want more of, God stands to win out in your life. But here's the hard one. Where do you need God's rescue? Where do you need him to come in and save the day? Is it your marriage? Is it your attitude? Is it an addiction? Surrender before the king who saves. Darius came in contact with a very real reality that we have a God who saves. And he became, I think, the second king in Babylonian history to have his world shattered by the true living God. Now, that's a man in a pretty high place. It would benefit you and I to humble ourselves with the same consequence of truth. That we serve a God who's big enough to save who's big enough to redeem the most broken of our areas. And I'm telling you something, we are going to be a church that lives expectant of a God to win in these ways. What are you going to do to spend time with your Savior? That it might produce and yield a fruit so that when you come to living out your purpose, the lifestyle that backs it matches.